Welcome to the Laverne Church of the Brethren's weekly audio message. Here at the Laverne Church of the Brethren, we create a Christian community called by Christ to be inclusive, caring, and peace-minded. We affirm that people of any race, ethnic identity, gender identity, sexual orientation, ability, age, economic status, faith tradition, or life situation are welcome in our congregation. We believe in compassionate service, stewardship of creation, respect for diversity, and nonviolent reconciliation for differences among all people, nations, and faith traditions. We claim no creed but the New Testament as exemplified by the life of Christ. We strive to follow the way of Jesus. And through these efforts, we seek to grow ever closer to the mind and heart of God. And now let us ground ourselves as we enter into today's message. This morning's scripture comes to us from the book of Mark, chapter 7, verses 24 through 30. From there, Jesus set out and went away to the region of Tyre. He entered a house and did not want anyone to know that he was there. Yet he could not escape notice, but a woman whose little daughter, who had an unclean spirit, immediately heard about him, and she came and bowed down at his feet. Now the woman was a Gentile of Syrophoenician origin. She begged him to cast the demon out of her daughter. He said to her, let the children be fed first, for it is not fair to take the children's food and throw it to the dogs. But she answered him, sir, even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. Then he said to her, For saying that, you may go. The demon has left your daughter, and when she went home, she found the child lying on the bed and the demon gone. For about a year, one of my kiddos had a a challenging time in many activities. He had difficulty recognizing numbers, letters, and even writing with a pencil. When we put on a show to have a few moments of respite at home, he stood about an inch away from the TV. I thought it was rather close and would encourage him to find a more comfy seat, but he always refused. On bike rides, he would most mischievously bump into everyone and everything. Because of the sheer number of times he would crash into one of our other kids, or worse yet, strangers, we often asked him to take a break and walk beside his bike for a few minutes, hoping that this minor consequence might motivate him to stop crashing into others. Fast forward one year. After a routine eye exam, we learned that he was in desperate need of glasses. Not just any glasses, like legitimate ultra-strength lenses for a first grader. Astigmatisms in both his eyes, farsightedness, the whole deal. You might imagine the transformation we saw after he received his new frames. Within weeks, he began to recognize numbers and letters. He began sitting a bit farther away from the TV to watch his favorite show, Octonauts. And what I'm most grateful for is the fact that he stopped running into everything and everyone on our bike rides. And he knows the importance of his new lenses. He treats his glasses with the utmost care and respect because he knows what an impact they have on his life. At night, I'll read him a story and he'll stop me mid-book to go run and grab his glasses. They put things into perspective for him, help him grasp things he might not have otherwise understood. The power of his frames is mighty. In seminary, I enrolled in a class called The Gospel of Luke Through the Lens of Homelessness. At the start of the class, students were posed this question in a group discussion. Who has predominantly taught you scripture and theology? Name the social categories they belong to. I thought that was an interesting question. 
one that no one had ever directly asked me before. At the time of considering that question, I had been privileged to hear the most incredible sermons from Susan Boyer and Donna Welch, my mentors and previous beloved pastors of this congregation. Yet, in reality, over the course of my entire life, these women were not my predominant teachers of theology or scripture. As I reflected on the question at hand, I noticed a specific similarity in my predominant spiritual teachers and leaders. The majority of those who instructed me about the biblical text and the ways of God were European, white, cisgender, heterosexual, middle to upper class men. I was somewhat astonished to realize that I was majorly influenced from such a, a small group of people in virtually the same social categories. This truth left me feeling like a rug was pulled out from under me. Now, Dr. Smith didn't leave the class hanging in despair with this newfound realization. Her solution was a liberating one. Try on a new pair of lenses. Approach the biblical text, approach God, Christ, spirituality through various lenses, many perspectives. Try new frames on for size. Let's take, for example, the scripture we heard today, the story of the Syrophoenician woman. In my tradition of origin, I heard this story deciphered with a focus on the importance of faith. I distinctively remember being taught the story in this way. This woman asked Jesus to heal her daughter. Jesus refused her, not out of cruelty, but as an opportunity for her to demonstrate her incredible faith. And by golly, just as Jesus had intended, she did not give up. Jesus knew she would respond to his no with a persistent comment. He knew that she would say, even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. This remark, was a sign of her great faith. So, voila, Jesus healed her daughter. In the dominant lens of my upbringing, it was all in the plan. Yet, when I put on a womanist lens, a lens that centers the experience of black women, I see quite a different picture. Womanist and New Testament scholar, Dr. Mitzi Smith, brings to light the triple stigma this woman holds in her ancient society, her gender, race, and the fact that she is a mother of a demon-possessed daughter. Smith's interpretation identifies the play between racism, sexism, and classism in this narrative. Smith boldly points out the derogatory nature of Jesus's response to the woman's request to heal her daughter. He equates this woman to a dog, a name historically used to demean Gentiles, and a name by which I'm sure many women have been called even in this room today. Smith's lens acknowledges that much like us, Jesus was a product of the system in which he was raised, one that consciously and, and subconsciously oppressed various groups of people. My favorite part of Smith's interpretation is this. The Syrophoenician woman talks back to Jesus. She sasses him. With Smith's lens, her daughter is not healed by virtue of her faith, but by virtue of her protest against prevalent oppressive structures against Jesus himself. Smith summarizes the importance of this story in this way. We need to celebrate sass and talk back in women of color, as well as in white women, as a legitimate form of agency and a method of truth-telling, rather than punishing women for speaking truth boldly in the face of corrupt, biased, life-threatening, and denying authority. In taking off the dominant cultural lens of my upbringing and putting on a new lens, I can see the beauty in sass, the strength that resides in marginalized voices, the truth that even the best of us are byproducts of the system and culture in which we live. What other lenses might we try on while reading this text? Like a womanist lens, a feminist lens might notice that the woman is not named, a significant piece that many women have experienced in the workplace, 
community, and even at home. Do our names matter? Are our voices safe? As a young woman in my early 20s trying to find a place in ministry, I often found that my humble, unrelenting hours of service was always readily accepted, but my own name and voice, on the other hand, were often disregarded. Looking at this text through the lens of speciesism, we might notice the hierarchy associated between people and animals. What are we to do with that? Should not animals deserve more, more than crumbs on this planet in which we all reside? we put on the lens of a child, we might wonder why the Syrophoenician's daughter plays such an inconsequential role in the story. She too is unnamed, likely to do with the way in which ancient society treated children in general as property. What might this child be enduring and why? In what ways do we see children as objects even today? Even the premise of this series we're entering into presumes sight, and like many scriptures, it lifts up a sense that not every person possesses. How might texts of sight, hearing, and illness impact those among us with a disability or disabilities? The lenses in which we can enter into this text are endless. I'm encouraged, though, that the brethren are inherently a people who read scripture in community, who seek understanding of God and faith in conversation with one another. Historic brethren churches had a rotating pulpit. Elders or leaders of the church often shared in the role of preaching, albeit they were white men. The premise of rotating voices is still deeply rooted in, in who we are as a community of faith today. This idea that we should wrestle with texts as a community and, and wrestle with theological understandings together is still present. During this series, we're leaning into that brethren history and we'll be trying on various lenses for size. Next week, we'll hear from the University of Laverne president, Dr. Madavi, through her lens as an Iranian American. In the weeks to come, we'll try on a Jewish lens, a queer lens, an African-American lens, a feminist lens, and more. Because, church, the lenses we wear matter. They put elements of the biblical text and characteristics of God into focus. They prompt questions, thoughts, and shape our expressions of faith. Like my son, putting new frames on might help keep us from constantly crashing into metaphorical cyclists on the bike trail, which is life. By enlarging our understandings, we might see the power in sass and choose to speak the names of the unnamed or often overlooked. We might consider the ways we can live in mutuality with animals and examine the ways our society disregards children. I'm hopeful that as we embark on this series together, that we will broaden our awareness and increase our empathy of humanity. I'm hopeful that we might open our eyes to the new ways of understanding the Bible, God, and one another. I'm hopeful that as we try on new lenses for size, we might become a more faithful, inclusive, and just church body. We're so glad that you listened to the message today. If you're looking for an open and affirming, peace-loving and justice-seeking congregation, consider visiting us for in-person worship on Sundays at 9.30 a.m. We'd love to meet you.